Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Reverend Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Well, praise the Lord and welcome again to another exciting time of study in God's Word. I have uh, been talking to people, and this Bible study is so timely. As you know, we're going to be looking at the keys to your breakthrough. What are the keys to your spiritual breakthrough? And we started, this is part two. Please go back and look at part one. But I need you to declare with me as we go into this study, as we go into the power of God's Word, Say, this is my season. This is my season. I need you to know that the season we're in, according to the world, is a season of darkness and a season of dread and a season of gloom. You got people saying that they are binge-watching television programs, sitting around without getting the exercise they need for their bodies, and they're messing themselves up. That does not have to happen to a believer. Come on, go be in a word of prayer. You're going to need this. You better wake somebody up. Tell them you're going to need this study tonight. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the power in your word. Lord, I thank you for the depth of your word, God, that you would get the glory and honor out of everything that is said and done. And Lord, bring back to my remembrance and let your people know that you've set us free. Amen. I started out last week by telling you there is nothing impossible with God. I need to stay there. God said, hammer it. Hit on it. There is nothing. I don't care what your excuse. I don't care what you say to me. There's nothing impossible with God. But everything God tells us to do is laid out for us instructionally in his word. God is no respecter of persons. Whatever he wants, whatever you're trying to achieve, whatever area in your life you need help with, you need to know that God is a God who is doing, able to do what we need him to do. So if there's a failure, it is not on God. It is on us. So let's look right now at this idea of breakthrough, the keys to breakthrough. So spiritual breakthrough. You're at this level. The blessing that you need to achieve is at this level. So how do I go and get a breakthrough? Because breakthroughs are not, it's not some, you know, fancy word or me trying to get you to see some cliche. A breakthrough, I can show you scripturally, has always happened. And tonight we're looking at what are the keys to our breakthrough. All right, so we started in Mark 9. And the story goes, and I told you about the transfiguration, the story goes with the child who was demon-possessed, and this demon-possessed child was taken to the disciples. Now look at what happened. Jesus came back down the mountain from being transfigured, and all of the believers, his disciples, ran into three words that are devastating for a believer to hear, but they also have hope. Let's read verse 19. Go to your Bible. Go to Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 18. Let's start there. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away, and I spake to your disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Did you see it? It didn't say they were not able to. It did not say, it said they could not, which is not excluding them for having the power to do. The fact of the matter is they should 
have been able to do it, but they could not do it. I like the good King James, but you know what it says? It, it shows you how the devil moves around. He foameth and gnashes and pineth and all these words just means that the devil will act a fool. You need to remember that. That a lot of times when you're going through a struggle, it's because the devil raises his head at a moment. I share with you, this was not seizures. This was not some other illness. This was spiritual warfare. And many of us are into spiritual warfare. Let's look at this unnamed son in the text was demon possessed. And they could not cast out the demon. What happened to their power? Here's why I said they should have been able to. Luke 10, 17, we went over this. When Jesus sent them out, they had power over devils. You've had the power of the enemy. There was a time you did knock the enemy out. There was a time you did win. Can I ask you a question that this text is happening? Is asking, what happened that you were strong? And now you better keep listening to me. What happened that you could do it? And now all of a sudden, the enemy's just running rampant, has nothing to do with COVID, has nothing to do with anything except our ability to spiritually making sure that I got to break through this plateau and go here because here is where my destiny is. Watch this. They have power. Luke 10, 19, God said, I gave you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, which is talking about the devil. And watch these words. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Mark 9, 28. Watch this. And when he was coming to the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? Here's our keys. I'm getting there quickly. To some of you who are sitting back, waiting on light to come to you, look what the text said. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Prayer changes things. Prayer is God's power. Sometimes the vessel praying needs to be sanctified, needs to be brought closer to God. That's where fasting comes in. When we fast, our spirit gets stronger and our flesh gets weaker. That's why we don't like to fast. That's why we get hungry, because we don't realize when we go into those areas where our flesh is denied, oh, this is good. When we go into those areas, the enemy has no control over us because we've taken on purpose the desire to turn to God and not just walking around. Now, I'm not talking about punishing yourself for not eating. That's not what this is about. It is about taking some time to put my flesh under and concentrate on God. And you know what it is? I said, some of you listening to me now, I heard what you said. It is hard. I am hungry. So am I. But if we ever decide that we run into a this kind, you can sit there and say, Pastor, I don't need to do this. What about if you're in a this kind experience? What about if right now the darkness in your life is going to invade your life forever until you get a breakthrough? What about if right now all the little cute Christian stuff you're doing, getting on Facebook, typing back all kind of bold messages that the Lord never fails, but you're not broke, you're not moving up, then what about you? What about this don't you understand? The keys to a breakthrough. I'm not saying you can't get it any other way. But I'm saying there are some kinds of experiences. There are some biblically based examples of saints of God who would not have made it if they didn't turn their place aside and they didn't pray and fast. Watch this. Jesus said, for a spiritual breakthrough, prayer and fasting are your keys. When you hear the word this kind, that's where you have to evaluate it. I can name you some this kind situations. Death. A person lost mother and father to COVID. Now the husband's sick. That's a this kind experience. A person's unemployment is running out. Not only is their unemployment running out, they lost their medical health benefits. And now they're sick. That's a this kind. What I'm telling you is this kind of what? We know in the text 
This kind means demonic or devilish situations. The demon, because this is when Jesus said this kind of stronghold, this kind of demon only comes out through prayer and fasting. But I thought he said, Pastor, we have, uh, God gave us power, authority over serpents and scorpions. Yes, but he didn't say your vessel could be in any kind of condition to do it. He said, maybe there's some tweaking you have to do. I don't know why we don't understand this. We get ready to go on a trip. Many of us who got sense, if you're driving a long way, you get your tires checked, check the air, you check your oil, make sure the car is running good, maybe you give it a wash job, and the wash job is something, you know, cosmetic, but you also make sure you got gas in the tank, you make sure the engine is okay. How come you want to come to God asking him for a miracle, a powerful miracle, which is really nothing for him, but has to flow through you? How are you asking him for a miracle and don't want to clean the vessel that has to pro produce the miracle that God wants to perform? Here's how. This kind means sometimes I have to pray, what is my spiritual direction? Nehemiah 1 and 4, and it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. You know the story, Nehemiah was in a no-win situation as a cupbearer to the king. He was asked, he saw the walls of Jerusalem torn down, he got a burden in his heart and had to go. I want to speak to that for a moment. You can't be like everyone else if God places a burden on you. If God places a burden in your heart, you got to bear the burden. So you may have to fast and pray just to do what we call normal. I don't feel right. I don't feel normal. It's because you're normal as far as God is concerned. The spiritual place you're supposed to be is you must be someone who fasts and prays. This kind of trouble for your destiny, Esther. It says Esther called for all the Jews to fast, not to drink anything, take no food, night or day. And she said, if I perish, let me perish. I'm going to the king. Watch Esther. Esther said, I'm in a situation that I could die, but I'm going to fast and pray so I have the strength to be able to handle what is going on so I can make it to save my people. You know the story. This kind means anything, here's what I want you to see, that is stopping you from experiencing victory in God. Watch this. So let's say that again. What are you saying? I'm saying that if you don't have a victory, keep checking on, you know, what you're doing, you know, go through your regular routine. But if it's not working, it's time for you to fast and pray. What does it mean anything? Anytime there's no victory in your walk, it's time for you to use your spiritual keys. Are you saying saints ought to be victorious? Yes. I'm never saying you ought to be, you never should fight, and you never should get down, and you never should be under. What I'm saying is the whole time you're fighting, you should realize I'm really fighting from a position or a perspective of victory. Every time you fight, you have to say to yourself, Jesus, oh, I'm helping somebody, Jesus already won this for me. I'm just going to stand until I take it. That's a blessing. Jesus already did this for me. I'm just going to pray until I get it. It's already mine. All I have to do is know I expect victory. I expect to have to fight. Maybe I'll get wounded. Maybe I'll get a little bloody. But at the end of the day, I will win this fight. If there any, this kind means anything stopping you from having power over the enemy. The enemy should never victimize you. The enemy is always going to attack you. Yes, he's going to attack you. Okay, let me talk to the people that's shocked that he's going to attack you. He's going to attack you, but he should never get the upper hand over you. Somebody ought to say right now, devil, you're barking up the wrong tree. I'm not the one that you're going to defeat. This kind means over, here's the tough one, I left this one for last. Means when you're, if it's stopping you from getting victory over your flesh. The toughest enemy 
we all have to face is us, you. I am, by far, you can't do nothing to me with all the protection God has given me unless I allow it. And I can allow it by not being prayed up, by not having enough word in me, by not standing strong long enough. I can find myself in a position where I don't have victory. Now, I said last week to all of those who did not believe, I'm going to show you from the scripture, God, Jesus, your Savior, God, your Father. I, 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 when I saw this, I said, wow, we think we're doing something special when we fast and pray. But did you know, God expects us to fast. He expects us to pray. Let's watch this. Matthew 6, when Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount, he explicitly went into some very king, very key kingdom principles while he was doing it. And when he was preaching the sermon, he said in Matthew 6 and 5, and when thou prayest, stop. He didn't say if you pray. He didn't say pray when you get in trouble. He didn't say find a way to pray when things get tough. He said when you pray. So God says when we pray, we shall be not as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And the rest of this text is going to the sincerity of our prayer. Let me let you get that. And when we pray, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen. So God has even given us, as I shared with you earlier, prayer. You know how some people, um, you can pray up something in front of other folk. Get all austere and, you know, you fall into this very spiritual posture. Oh, Lord, our God, all that kind of stuff really don't mean anything. But can you pray yourself free while you're at your house? Can you pray yourself free from the burdens and struggles you're dealing with on a daily basis? Ask yourself that question. As you look, can, you pray, can you pray yourself free? That means that it's not a prayer of pretense. It's a prayer of sincerity. Matthew 6. So God expects us to pray. Watch this. Matthew 6, 16. Further down that text. Moreover, when you fast. He didn't say if you fast. This is Jesus giving us kingdom principles. Telling us for his, uh, for his children. He's, given, he's expounding some of the things and kingdom principles that help us have the same power on earth. The Beatitudes, and he's telling us how to walk, and he's telling us not to judge. He's also telling us in that same vein, when it comes out of Jesus' mouth, Jesus is telling us when you fast. Some of us have been violating it, wonder why we don't have power. We never turn our plate down, except if it's a special request by the church or the pastor, or there's a special, we're going to all do the Daniel fast, but that's not the kind of fast that delivers you. It's got to be coming from your heart. Look what he said. Here it is again. The genuineness, the sincerity comes from the heart. As the word enters you, it is the heart power of the word. It's when you speak with thunder. It's when you let it out. So I said, Pastor, why do you get so animated? I can't be one of those pastors who are calm with all of this dynamite in God's word. Where we sit down there. And you know, the Lord said, I ain't got nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that. If that is your demeanor. But when I think about it, that I can speak a word to my spirit and my circumstances, the unseen circumstances of my life, change through the power of this word, I'm not going to sit there and say it calmly. I'm going to say it confidently. It reminds me of Jesus going through, and he was went inside the temple to clear out the money changers. He didn't walk through there, you know, get out, got to leave. He didn't walk through there like that. Jesus was allowing the power and authority to come. When he was on the cross, why do you think when he ushered to his father, Eli, 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 Sabathani, when he hollered that out, you know, why do you think he screamed, the text said, and he hollered with a loud voice, 
Eli, 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 why do you think he howled? Because there was a soul cry. Sometimes, I'm recommending this. You can say you heard it from this crazy preacher because I've done it. Sometimes the demonic is so thick in your life that you got to rise up. You may have to march through your house, quoting scriptures, put a path through your house. Get in that bedroom where the darkness attacks. Get on the outside of that house and walk around your house pre preparing and quoting words of God, saying this area is off limit. In every place, God said, the sole of your feet shall go. Somebody ought to get happy with me. When you know I can rise up boldly and let it out. Don't just lay there. Well, um, you know, it was in my mind, but it never got to your lips. The Bible tells us confession is where our power comes from. Confess it loudly. I am healed. Confess it loudly. My bills are paid. Confess it loudly, just like he did before. He'll do it again. Confess it loudly. I'm getting better, not worse. Confess it loudly. And let the power of God ring through you. And don't stop till there's no air in your body. As long as you can breathe, scream out and watch God come. Jesus said, I'm still saying he expected us to fast. They came to Jesus and said, Jesus. Why do the disciples of John fast? Why do we, the Pharisees, fast, but your servants or disciples don't fast? Jesus said, I have a very great explanation for you, and I hope you understand that it is the divine. Look what he said. He's, and Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom. He's given the symbolism of the church being the bride of Christ. He said, the attendant of the bridegroom, he's the bridegroom, we're the bride, cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away, and they will fast. God gave us a command. He expects me to fast. If I look and a whole year is going by and I haven't turned down my plate once, and I wonder why I have no strength? I wonder why I'm going backwards instead of forward. You ever heard anybody say the old cliche, the faster or the hurrier I go, or the faster I go, the more behind I get. Sometimes you're going fast with no substance. But if you stop and say on purpose, intentionally, I will fast and pray. Watch what God does. So let's look at some of the benefits of praying and fasting. During this period, talking about we're fasting, we fast to pause, that's what I call it, it's like I pause, warfare going around. I hit reset, all right? I'm gonna get back to that place where I had the strength and the courage to handle what I was going through. So I pause, come on, pause. I know a thousand demons screaming in here. Trouble all around you. God said, just stop. It's biblical. It reminds us that God says, be still and know that I'm God. It reminds us when God says, "Has thou not heard, Had thou not known that the everlasting God, the creator of all the universe, fainteth not, neither is he weary. They that wait, sometimes God is saying, just pause. And watch what happens. He said, when we do that, he resets our spiritual life. Uh, you can go from raggedy to righteous just by pausing. Come on, look around your life. I don't know about you, but I've had some times when my spiritual life was raggedy. My tongue was out of whack. My confession was out of whack. My whining and complaining was out of whack. I was angry all the time. But I dust myself off with a little coat of spirituality and think I was doing okay. No. God said I have to reset your spiritual life. That's when we deny our flesh to strengthen our spirit. Can I tell you something? There are some days I rise up. I'm an early riser, like to exercise. When I get done working out, I am famished. Some days I'm working out thinking what I'm going to eat when I get back. 
<laughs> I'm not the only one. Sometimes you can visualize stuff. That's what the devil does. You remember what? When he tempted Eve? If you read that text, it doesn't say Eve was even thinking about the fruit. But the devil brought something to her that was pleasing to her flesh. And if you look at the interaction and the exchange between Eve and Satan, you'll find out it was the food. It was something that the flesh could devour that allowed her to fall. She did not have her flesh under control. I'm not saying don't eat. I'm saying sometimes pause and say, I'm, I'm giving this time to Christ. It, it, fasting is not just not eating. Fasting is when I turn to God. I'm giving that to God. Fasting and prayer are not necessarily done together. But they usually have more weight when done together to honor our Heavenly Father. Once your heart and your spirit gets in a prayer posture. Did you know that a prayer posture is not kneeling and not bowing all the time? A prayer posture is when your mind has surrendered. When you're in a prayer posture that says, this day, I'm getting ready. You know what I'm talking about. Right before you pray, it's like you surrender that thought and let that thought come in. I'm going to pray this out. Before you get in that prayer posture when you're there if you would add fasting boy you put a double clamp on your flesh because the flesh doesn't want to pray but it definitely doesn't want to fast so when you just say you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna turn my plate down soon as you do hamburgers french fries steak those little, you know, red velvet cupcakes, they say, Pastor, you shouldn't be talking about that. You tend to be like the devil. I'm just telling you, that's what will go through your mind. You weren't thinking about red velvet until you started fasting. Come on, tell the truth. Or me, I like that impossible whopper. Wow. Some days, I'm, that impossible whopper is good because I don't eat red meat. So when they made the impossible whopper, it's a way for me to act like I was eating red meat and get the, you know, get the healthy benefits. But, so sometimes I would get that whopper two, three times a week. When I'm fasting, I had to stop. Watch this. Prayer is open communication between us and God. That's what prayer is. And that's why I tell people, don't be frightened to pray. Just start conversing uh, with the relationship you have. That's key. Prayer is not trying to outpray someone else or having a more austere prayer than someone else. Prayer is God. This is my relationship. This me, this you, let's roll. Prayer is like talking to a friend. That's why God called Abraham friend. Abraham sat in front of God and just talked. That's what prayer is. It's open. I like open. See, what open means is God already knows us. It's us trying to get to know him. Hmm. On the other hand, that's prayer. Fasting is defined as going without food to focus on prayer and fellowship. So once I go without food, I focus on my prayer life with God and my fellowship with God. So fasting is not just not eating. That's when you get all set. I got one more hour. I got one more hour. I can go. Woo! You haven't learned anything when you got one more hour. What you got to be able to say is fast through that. Let your mind and your conscience be sold out to what you're doing with God. So I want to go here. What is the power? Here are the keys. Let's look at some biblical examples so we can see the power of prayer and fasting in the scripture. First, you got to get your breakthrough. When you pray and fast, I'm going to leave these up so you can write them down. When you pray and fast, so you're sitting here saying, I got to get out of this. I have to get, that's all the breakthrough is. I got to get out of this situation. So when you pray and fast, you can get your breakthrough. Next, when you pray and fast, you will stay spiritually strong. You notice I said stay. Because there's moments in our life where we know uh, my mind has me somewhere where my flesh really isn't. You know how in our minds sometimes we can think how spiritual we are until it's time to stand. It's easy to say God's a healer until you have to stand through some sickness. It's easy to say he'll supply my needs until your stuff gets cut off. It's easy to say, oh child, you know how we give advice to other people? Oh child, you know the Lord can do that until you have to 
stand for God to do that. Give the same advice to yourself. So it's staying spiritually strong. It's not just having my mind and body out of whack. I stay spiritually strong. Then I can retain power over the demonic. Don't ever, ever, ever let your guard down. I don't want to talk about, I, don't, I never talk and give all the credit to the devil, but don't ever think the enemy is not after you. Don't ever think spiritual warfare is going to cease. We are always going to be in a posture where we have to fight. I didn't say that. The Bible said that, that you ought to fight. Uh, when Paul was about to leave, he said, look, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. If, when you look at the words, Paul fought his whole life. This is not, this is not, uh, uh, the, you know, this is not the playground. This is the battleground. This is not, you know, the football field where you get hit, you know, with a good block. No, this is where they are shooting bombs. They are shooting missiles at you. This is where the devil wants to blow you up and take you out. But remember I said you're in a posture of victory. And if you don't believe that, I'll tell you this, and I know you have to agree with me. If the enemy could have taken you out and stopped you, he would have done it by now. No, no, he, would, he didn't do it because God is on your side. But he couldn't do it because God has given us too much power. Power to represent Christ. Remember I told you that. The disciples, when they were, they were shocked that the disciples couldn't cast out the demon because the disciples were supposed to represent Christ, and they did not. Next, we need to have strong faith. Fasting and prayer gives us strong faith because our spirit man gets stronger. Now, let me take this back. I, I you know, sometimes you listen to preachers teach and you don't catch everything. You don't say nothing to them, but you know... I want you to study your Bible, so I want you to get my points, and I want you to apply them to you. Get your breakthrough. Stay spiritually strong. Retain power over the demonic. You have power to represent Christ. You are Christ. You are God's representative. You have strong faith whenever you pray and fast. Did you get them? Don't worry. Go back to our, our YouTube or Facebook. You can pick them up later. Let's go on. So let's look at what are, what are some of the power. Let's look at some biblical examples so you can see how saints of God apply this to their life. Um, first of all, Ezra 8, 22 and 23. Now listen to this. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of God is upon all of them for is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. Look at verse 23. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated. In us. This is Ezra. The book of Ezra, in a quick summary, uh, actually chronicles the return from Babylonian exile. Thirteen years before Nehemiah, there was a group that left under Zerubbabel, and they went back to Jerusalem under Cyrus. So we have now this first group coming back to build and reestablish the temple in Jerusalem. They went, and then 80 years later, a group headed by Ezra, who was a scribe and a priest, his main focus was to get the people back to God. Here's what Ezra is saying in that 8th chapter. He was saying, because we made so much fuss about how powerful our God is, we were ashamed, because they had to go from Babylon back to Jerusalem, we were ashamed to say, hey, give us some, you know, some soldiers to protect us while we go this way. Said no, because we told the king that the hand of God is with us. And since the hand of God is with us, he gives us power. So what we did to solidify that power was we fasted and we sought our God for this. And he heard us. That is so powerful. Look what, I, look what happened. 
Fasting and prayer is a key because it gives you strength for your journey. No matter what enemies you confront, Ezra tells us that if we trust God, they fasted and prayed. Here, here go the twin keys. They fasted and prayed, and God got them safely back. So we need to know that fasting and prayer is for our is for strength for my journey. I don't know what your journey is like. Some days my journey is yeah, it's there. It is heck. I love God, but there are tough days, if you're honest. So first thing we need to know, if I begin fasting and praying, when I hit that bump in the road, I'll have strength. The next thing, the hand of God is, oh, the next thing we need to look at is to seek God's guidance for the battle. Judges 20, 26. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came unto the house of God and wept. And sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings unto the Lord. So, um, this was God's guidance for battle. This is a very ugly, ugly text. If you open your Bible, um, I, I, I taught judges and there are some horrific things in there. I always say when you talk to atheists or people who don't know God and don't understand God, they will tell you sometimes that, um, how do they say, that's bad. Look, look how evil your God was. Destroy this, do this. No. Let me plant something in your mind so you understand. It was never God. It was always the heart, mind, evilness, the allegiance with darkness that came through man. Somebody said, why didn't God stop us? Because that's what's called our free will. That's what's called our ability to make a decision. You can't run around, have God deliver you with all the good stuff, and when you sit down and fail, want to blame it on God when you didn't act accordingly. So in this story, in Judges, you know, in Judges I always say, this is the, this is the book where they had the key verse, and there was no king in the land, and every man did what was right in his own eyes, right? So in Judges chapter 20, we find out the kingdom is still in disarray. you got the 12 tribes. Well, this is a story where a Levite was traveling with his concubine as he was traveling through to retrieve her back from her father's house. If you read the text, it tells you that he decided on the way back to Israel, they had nowhere to turn in, so they went past all of the places that where Israelites did not live, he, the text calls them strangers, and it said they stopped and they decided to sleep in the street in Gibeah, which was where the Benjamites were, the tribe of Benjamin. So as they were, as he was sleeping in the street with his servant, his donkey, and his concubine, an old man came along and said, come to my house, you're not sleeping in the street. Well, that night, men from Benjamin came to the house and wanted to drag the man out to know him. And the, the old man said, please don't do this vile thing. I have my daughter and I have his concubine. We'll send them out. And you can have your way with them. I know that's horrible. They sent them out. And it says all night long they abused these two women. The next day when the man got up at the doorstep was his concubine. He told her, let's go. But she didn't say anything because she died. He put her on the donkey, took her back to his place. This is the horrible part. Cut her body into 12 pieces, sent it out all over Israel to tell what vile thing Benjamin had done, how they had raped his concubine and killed her, supposedly to be his brothers. Well, the text tells us that when he got out, all the Israelites came together. They were going to fight against Benjamin. So they got together this army. The first time they went out, the Benjamites destroyed them, 20,000 of them. They came back and prayed, got the Ark of the Covenant. They prayed. Benjamites killed another 18,000. This last time is the verse we're at. Then all the people, children of Israel, and all the people went up and came up to the house of God and wept. And look at the verse. And sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the text tells us when they inquired, God said, go up now. 
I've given them into your hand. Understand this. They had prayed before, got defeated. That's why you don't stop. They had prayed and knelt in the Ark of the Covenant, got defeated. That's why you don't stop. But after they fasted and prayed together, God gave them victory and they smote the Benjamites. What am I telling you? You got to seek God's guidance. And especially, praying and fasting was the key to victory in a place where they had failed before. Praise God. The next power, to express and resolve grief. 1 Samuel 31, 13. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabosh and fasted seven days. All right, you got the text? 1 Samuel 31. This is the end of Saul. Saul had gotten to the place that he was so far away from God that he had just sought a witch. After seeking the witch and going into battle, the Philistines defeated, and the text tells us that Saul and his three sons were destroyed. When the Philistines came over and saw their bodies, they cut off Saul's head, they dismembered their body, and sent them all throughout the Philistine territory as a declaration of victory. And then they took their armor with the rest of their body parts in it and nailed it up in a specific place. And the Bible tells us in the verses preceding this that all the people went out, but even though Saul was evil, he was the king, they took his body down. And the Bible says, and they took the bones and buried them under a tree and fasted. Here is what you need to see. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next verse so it ties together. It goes right into 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. And this is David now. And they mourned and wept and fasted on evening for Saul and Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. Let's put it together. So the men of Israel now had no king. Remember, David was already an outlaw. He was no longer in Israel. He was running around. So, but once David and his men heard about it, they grieved. What am I telling you? Grief will kill you if you never get strength to get over the grief. I can't stay here long, but listen to me. I'm not even talking about the much, the realistic stages of grief that we can get stuck at. I'm just talking about when your spirit gets so grieved that your world closes in on you. Because you can't get over the grief. I'm talking to somebody in a very serious way. David loved Jonathan. He was grieving. The people were mad. They were, they were grieving because they didn't have a king. Israel was wide open now. All I'm saying is they had a multitude of checkbooks, just like we do. Why am I crying? You know, I, I, lost, I lost my husband. I lost my wife. I, I lost my child. I, I can't believe my uncle's gone. And we live in a time of terrible death. And I'm not, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is that you need to make sure you're prepared to get through your grief. And when the grief starts killing you, get on your knees and fast and pray specifically to lift that spirit of heaviness and grief off of you. After they fasted seven days, while you're fasting, God can speak a word to you. God can speak some joy to you. God can speak some refreshing to you. Nobody likes grief, but we're not supposed to get stuck because we know we have another side we're going to, right? That was David and his men uh, sharing that. To seek deliverance and protection. When the, and this is a powerful one here. You know, 2 Chronicles, when Jehoshaphat and the people, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim fast throughout all Judah. That's the, that's the church, that's the, the verses of victory. We know this is the text where uh, Am Ammon and Moab had come against Jehoshaphat and they bought this big army and they were ready to destroy him and they were destroying everything in their way. But Jehoshaphat called a fast. And if you read the, the verses following this fast that was called, the Bible said that God told him to set out the praisers. Praise God. I, I can't stay here, but how many of y'all know? Praise. If, if I'm look, they just got done fasting and praying. That means they got closer to God. Now all of a sudden they were told to praise. 
You don't think there was power in that praise? That was a praise of seeing God's divinity. That was a praise of seeing the glory of God. That was a praise of where my flesh had been put subdued and my spirit could tell and speak out the wonders of the Lord. So it said they praised, set up the praisers and the priests. And they went first into the battle. And the Lord set up ambushments and they defeated their enemy. They prayed and fasted. Their spirit got stronger. And when the praise came out, there was deliverance. And Judah gathered themselves together, asked help of the Lord. Even out of the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So here's the address so you can write this down again. It's Chronicles 20, 2 Chronicles 20, verses 3 and 4. In the scripture, this type of fell. Oh, that's very important. I made myself a note. You can't do that kind of prayer and fasting with an unbeliever. You got to call a believer up and have another believer with you because you lose your power. This is where you need a collective power. So if you get another believer that will fast and pray with you, it will be awesome. To express repentance and a return to God. And they gathered together at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on the day and said, There we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Um, this is when the children of Israel, God, through Samuel, told them, quit following or quit your idolatry, quit following other gods. And the text says they got together at that point and their hearts were poured out to God and they, and they knew they had sinned against the Lord. So they fasted that day. And watch this. When they fasted and prayed, it says... They turned away from uh, Astaroth and Baal, uh, Baal, excuse me, and Baal. And watch this. So here's what happened. Samuel said, if you guys don't pray and turn away your idols, you're not going to, God said he's not going to go with you. There'll be no more victory. But what we need to see that was more important is after they couldn't give up the idols, until after they prayed and fasted. Then it said, boldly in the text, they gave up following the other idols. I'm telling somebody, you might need to break a habit, not by grunting and willpower. You got to turn your plate down and fast. Think about getting control of your flesh and now applying that to habits in your life. This type of fasting shows us serious about returning to the path of godly obedience. To humble oneself before God. This is a tough one here, guys. I don't even want to mess with this, but I will. King Ahab. That's right. I can't believe Ahab fasted. That's all I'm going to say about this text. You've got to find it. And the Bible says, Ahab heard these words. That he rent his clothes and put his sackcloth upon him, flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and ashes and went softly. God turned back a prophecy of destruction on Ahab after he fasted. Wow. Do you realize right there there's somebody out there? If you remember, if I home, if he could forgive Ahab. Now, now, of course, there was there was destruction later because. You can humble yourself, but if you don't keep going, you're going to still be in need of a breakthrough. Everybody with me, you can still be in need. So, but remember, if we humble ourselves, God changes his mind and he changes our heart. That's powerful. When you humble yourself, God can change his mind and he can change your heart. And your heart contains your mind that God can change. And to express love and worship to God. Did I go too fast? I heard somebody say, he goes fast. To humble Yourself before God. That's what Ahab. The next one. We talk about the power. To express love and worship for God. Luke 2.37. Look at this. And then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. This is talking about Anna the prophetess. When Jesus had gone into the temple and we know that Anna the prophet had seen her, and there was another prophet that saw her early, saw Jesus earlier, you know, started prophesying. We know that. But watch this. If you go back and read verse 36, it says, Anna 
stayed with her husband seven years after her marriage. So if the marrying age for Jewish girls was 15, she stayed with him another seven years. And then she spent 84 years in the temple. We need to add that math up. Look how long she spent. Look, to express love and worship for God. She held on to a prophecy about Jesus, about the Messiah coming we, for 84 years. We know we have to add the 15 years onto the 84, which gives us 100, right? Uh, gives us 99. Then we add the seven years she lived with her husband before she was widowed. That means literally... Anna, the prophetess, was 106 years old. Let's do it again. 84 years she waited. She got married at 15. She stayed with her husband for seven years until she was widowed. So if we add that up, she was 106 years old. How do you wait, trust, love, and worship God that long? Here's how. When hard times come, when we are worshiping, loving, and waiting on God, the Bible said, she prayed and fasted day and night. There's power in fasting and praying. So for the hard times we are worshiping, loving, and waiting, we need to pray. To overcome temptation when our faith is tested, dedicate yourself to God. This is powerful right here.